Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to this Corporate Finance Performance Scrutiny Panel on Tuesday the 7th of May 2024. Uh, I'd remind you that this meeting is being recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel and could also remind everyone to switch on their microphone before addressing the meeting and remember to switch the microphone off when you finish speaking. Uh, I'll move on to apologies for absence which I've received from Councillors Sandra Thomas, Jit Ranabat and Jackie Smith. Are there any other apologies for absence? No. Nope. Fine. Uh, there is no urgent business. Uh, are there any declarations of interest in relating to items on the agenda that aren't already in the register? No, I see none. Are members happy to agree the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of March 2024? Yeah, thank you. Okay, and that brings us on to item five, which is the Legal Services Annual Performance Report 2022 to 23 and 23 to 24. Uh, this was to be presented by Emma Newby, but she's not been able to join us this evening. So I think Azuka will be presenting that for us, in which case over to you, please, Azuka. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this is Legal Services perform Annual Performance Report but it in fact straddles two years, so 22, 23, and 23, um, 24. Um, I'll just take you through the, the headlines. Um, some of you may know that legal services um, basically operates a model of in-house um, legal service to the council, which is supplemented by um, outsourcing work to um, barristers or to external solicitors um, usually for a, a range of reasons, for example, um, lack of capacity, in-house capacity. Um, it could be because of skills or because of particular areas of expertise or, or complexity. But our starting point is an in-house model. Um, we operate a framework for external solicitors and, and barristers. Um, we're part of the London, Lo London Legal Alliance. Um, with, I think it's now up to about 27 other um, London boroughs are on the alliance, and so we're able to access um, external legal support from um, solicitors and barristers on the framework. There are other frameworks, but that's the main one. <clears throat> um, the in-house teams basically um, divided into six um, teams set out in paragraph 4.4 of the report. The first um, um, five are practice areas. It is what it says on the tin, so housing and litigation deals with housing and all litigation. And then the last team is our practice management team, which is head, headed by Emma Newby and which supports legal services. Um, the, we have 49 established posts within legal services, including support staff. So that's probably a medium-sized um, um, legal team um, for a London local authority. There are some that are bigger, much, much bigger, and there are a few that are, are smaller than us, so we're, we're somewhere in the middle. In terms of volumes of work, um, just to give you a few headlines, um, we opened 2,700 cases in 22-23. Um, that was an increase of 26% um, on the previous year. Um, that fell slightly in 23-24, but all the indications currently are that that's on the upward um, trend, which will come as no surprise. Um, we have agreed vision and values for legal services, which you'll see at Appendix um, A attached to um, the report. In terms of staff development, um, legal services, we actively um, seek to develop our staff and our in-house capacity um, by providing development opportunities. And it's good in terms of staff morale, but also it helps us to deal with some of the challenges we're facing in terms of, of recruitment. So our strategy is very much um, one of grow, up, grow, grow your own. Um, and that's pretty much in line with the corporate um, approach in any event. And you'll see in paragraph 4.11 um, some of the um, developments, the common and honoraria <clears throat> opportunities currently um, within legal services. 
Service standards, all important. Um, we undertake an annual um, survey of our client um, departments, so each directorate is sent an annual survey. Um, the last survey, 94% of respondents um, rated the um, service as satisfactory or above. And of that, two-thirds rated the service as good um, or excellent. But it's not just an annual survey. We have regular um, client liaison meetings with our clients, um, client departments, and they haven't highlighted any significant um, service issues. But of course, we do keep you know, the services we provide under constant review, and we are constantly talking to our client departments um, just to understand where they are, what they want to achieve, what their priorities are, and see how we can fit, uh, fit in and, and assist them and support them in achieving those priorities. So in terms of um, legal services performance, the rest of the report, it sets out the performance by each of the teams. Um, do you want me to just quickly go through them or um, I'm happy to take any questions anyone has to ask? I think if the panel are able to take those as noted, the individual teams, rather than have Azuka talk through them, I'm sure we've all read through the report before. So I'm happy to go to questions if you are, Azuka. Yeah, you absolutely. Yeah. It's great. Um, so, I mean, to start with, um, you mentioned there were 49 established posts. How many vacancies do you currently have in the team? Apologies. We have a structural vacancy um, rate. Um, which we're trying to address, but currently we have approximately eight um, vacancies which are covered by locums, locum solicitors, which is not ideal because it's a much more expensive um, way of, of filling vacancies. We've just gone out to recruit um, to six of the posts, and in fact we're going through interviews as we speak. Great, thank you for that. Um, I have a number of questions here, but I'm keen to let panel members have a go first if they've got any. Or, yeah, Councillor Vandenbroek. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the report. It was really interesting to see the range of work, um, and I particularly was interested in the fish tank. That was my favourite. Um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, that, that was causing damp. Um, on the values, this, this may sound pedantic, but I would really like to see, there was a, there was, under, you've got the thing about use of tech, value for money, you've got maximizing the use of technology. Um, with people here who are, who work in IT and who use technology all the time, um, they might not get it, but I have seen technology not being value for money, so I'm wondering whether the, it, can, it, it often is, but just, it would be great if that line read, maximizing the use of technology to improve efficiency. Just, it's just a thought. It sounds a little pedantic, but I thought I'd say it. No, um, du duly noted. I should add, um, just to give you an example of the kind of technology we're talking about, we have um, an electronic case management system so all our cases are managed um, electronically. And in, in time, but it, it's subject to what happens in the courts, um, we're hoping to move to um, not having to take paper files to, to court. Um, we can currently email trial bundles to judges, um, file documents in court electronically, but for the majority of cases, we're still not quite as advanced um, as, say, for example, the Crown Prosecution Service are in, in the criminal courts, so we're still taking paper files, but that's the next step for us to tackle. Thank you. Um, on 4.1 uh, in the opening, and it, just to help to explain those that choose to watch this at home, as it were, in layman's terms, you talk about such instances outsourcing is cost-neutral to the organisation, and I think it's touched on later in the report, but maybe still not perhaps clearly in my mind. In what instances are some of these outsourcings cost neutral? And what do we mean by cost neutral to the organization, to the legal organization or to RBG as a whole? And, and where is that cost then met? Thanks. 
to, to the organization as a whole. So just using an example um, in relation to, to property um, and planning, um, we can charge um, our legal costs to the, our external, to, to, to our counterparts on the other side. Um, for example, Section 106 is um, come with a, a, a legal bill, so we can offset our, our time against um, those types of charges. A little bit more difficult with other areas of work, um, children safeguarding and, li and litigation, but certainly property regeneration is the ma main area where we can offset and recover our costs. Great, thank you. Um, have you got one? Yeah, Councillor Pearce, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for the report. Um, very interesting reading. I had a couple of questions around um, Section 4.20, uh, the disrepair. I'm just wondering, this is relating to the kind of uh, increase in the um, uh, in litigation that we've had, um, and, and I'm sure we've all had sort of spam emails from law firms, you know, attending the services. But I'm just wondering, is there anything that can be done to mitigate that? Uh, and, and, and what, uh, and if so, what, what kind of things? Um, just one other question. I'll just do it with a bunch of S. Just, just make it easier. Uh, 4.42, um, the uh, information commissioner complaints. I'm just wondering what's, if you knew what's driving that. Just sort of curious as to why we're getting more of those uh, type of complaints. Thank you. In terms of um, disrepair, we've experiencing the same as all local authorities. Um, one of the things that um, the Ministry of Justice um, has um, proposing to introduce is a fixed cost regime, which will mean that for disrepair cases, there's a maximum, there's a ceiling on the, the amount of costs um, solicitors acting for tenants can actually recover. That regime sadly isn't in place yet. It, it was promised um, I think two years ago, it was promised last September. Now the indications are that it could be some time towards the end of, of this year. Um, what's driving it is very much, I think, an awareness. You've seen the spam emails. I've heard radio adverts from um, firms to, uh, uh, addressed to um, tenants. So it's very much an, uh, an awareness and quite a, um, a proactive um, not quite assault, but a proactive approach to, to getting local authority um, tenants um, to, to initiate disrepair um, claims. It's on the basis of no win, no fee, so there's no immediate loss to, to the tenant, um, and the, the cost is very much in favor of the, of the solicitors. So we're all looking forward to the fixed cost regime um, but in the meantime, we are, we are managing um, a, a real increase um, in, in disrepair um, across the board. In terms of the ICO, um, not sure what's um, driving that. I think, again, it's, it's an awareness. People are, are more uh, um, aware of, of where they can go to complain, um, and, and they're, they're exercising that, that right but I think you'll see from the report that we're, we're dealing with those, um, you know, proactively. Um, and um, unfortunately, it's just a sign of, of where we are. Thank you very much. Um, just starting around a bit, coming back to 4.3 and recruitment, uh, recruitment in general. Um, you talk about further towards the end, benchmarking against other authorities has taken place. To, with a view to putting in place a localised workforce strategy. I wondered if any local authorities have had successes with recruitment. Are there any good shining examples out there that we've seen via that benchmarking? We know that um, we're all in the same boat in terms of, you know, we're, we're all fighting for the same pool of, of lawyers. Um, some areas are more difficult than others. Um, so, for example, in contracts and procurement, our vacancy has been running for a number of years. Same as with um, a senior planning um, um, lawyer. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, we're, we're all in a similar situation. 
There is an issue around um, other inner London um, authorities offering um, bigger salary packages, um, have to be honest, um, and, and, you know, that's attracting um, candidates away from us. Yeah, I don't think that's just a problem in legal, is it? <laughs> Unfortunately, so, sadly. Um, on 4.8, uh, you talk about service level agreements with directorates and a review of the performance KPIs. Um, I didn't see, and apologies if I missed them, but what the existing SLAs are in the performance KPIs and, and how often they're hit. Are, are they somewhere or could we get them as a follow-up? We're currently working on them. They're very light touch um, at the moment. Um, and so I think by the next report, we will have some that are agreed. When I say light touch, um, for example, we have um, standards, for example, in terms of response rates um, for particular um, areas of work. But certainly by our next report, we will have them a little bit more nailed down. They're currently in draft. Thank you. And, and on a similar theme, the annual legal survey, um, are there any departments or services that come across as particularly concerning in their responses that you feel need attention? And, and what kind of plan of actions are taken when the, those bad survey results come in? And how do you then monitor to see that they've improved by the next year? There aren't any directorates that, that stand out. Um, we have our regular client liaison meetings, and, and that usually has the effect of being able to, you know, head things off before they become real um, problems. Um, and we, we maintain good communications with the directorates. So if there are issues, I, I don't think there's a directorate that is, is backwards in, in, in coming forward. And, and that can only help us to improve things. Um, the assistant heads of legal for each um, director, for, for each department, um, are responsible for uh, monitoring and reviewing um, and then reporting to our, our DMT. Great, thank you. I think that just one thing that would be good to see is almost the, if you could share them with the scrutiny panel, even if they're generalized at some point going forward, is those survey responses and maybe a historical kind of trending across them so that could be monitored as well would be great. Um, perhaps we could agree that as a recommendation that the details of those surveys are published as well as the SLAs and the KPIs, if the panel are happy with that. Yeah, if we could put that down as a recommendation, then please, thank you. Um, and then one other question I had on, on 438, we talk about supporting schools. Just for my clarity, is that only local authority maintain schools or do we support academies or mats and whatnot as well? It's just our maintained schools. Great, thank you. Uh, and then one more from me, I think, and then a general. Oh, sorry, yes. So 461, uh, it was an interesting six here, not one we've heard much about, so one we should sing from the sheet. Um, substantial tranches of unregistered land have been registered to the council with further areas pending registration. Could you give some background on what that is, how that comes about, and how we secure it, what stops other people taking that unregistered land as well, thanks. There are, un unbelievably, even though the Law of Property Act is 1925, there are still tranches of, of land um, across the country and, and in the borough um, that are unregistered. Um, also, there are areas of land that weren't registered when they transferred over to the council from the, Lond the likes of the London Residuary um, board. So it's an exercise to identify those um, pockets of land and make sure we get them um, registered. There's a, a real proactive move towards doing that, not least because when we're talking about the kind of development that you see in the borough, um, we need to have, you know, land registered so that the title is clear um, and it doesn't hold up some of the major developments that we, we, we're trying to um, undertake. Do we ever get in a situation where someone else would make a case for that land or is it just a, a formal process we have to go to to register it is kind of ours? It's not at risk of being seized by someone else, I suppose, is the question. The, the majority is not at risk. It's, it's ours. We can clearly identify it. We can prove it. We have had one in the last, I think, um, 2018 
um, where there was a dispute about ownership um, and we weren't able to satisfy the land registry that it did in fact belong to us. So those who were in adverse possession were able to, to have it registered in their name. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, and then on 468, I read this with some interest um, in terms of potentially the impact that I read it that Brexit has had an impact on the intercountry cooperation for some of the searches that you needed to do. Um, so what I couldn't conclude from this is, has it made it more difficult? Has it made it just different? Or is it more onerous now since Brexit? Thanks. I think it's, it's more onerous and more difficult. Um, we're having to rely purely on the convention, whereas previously we could rely on reciprocal arrangements with other European um, countries. So it is definitely much more difficult. Okay, that's great to know. Thank you. Um, do panel members have any other questions on the reports? No? Okay. Um, oh, yes, Christine, if you'd like to counsel us. No, um, good afternoon. Is this still afternoon or good evening? No, I just wanted to say thank you for the report. Um, very interesting indeed. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Azuka, really, what, for you, what are kind of the priorities now looking ahead for the next year? Is, is the biggest, what are the biggest challenges you face? I think the biggest challenge is recruitment and retention and that's part of the work that we, we've started doing with the um, workforce strategy. Um, and I mentioned earlier on that we've just gone through a recruitment exercise, um, which is, you know, we've had some success. Um, and it's, it's really about looking at alternatives to the traditional methods of, of recruitment. Um, you know, you can, you can advertise in the Law Society Gazette all you want, but it's not necessarily attracting the kind of candidates that um, we're, we're looking for. So I think that's within staffing. I think in terms of um, operational issues, I think that until we get the fixed cost regime in disrepair, um, that is only going to continue to increase. Um, we've adopted, recently adopted um, a, a basically a commercial approach a strategy to dealing with some of the low-level um, disrepair and dealing with them very, very early on before the costs um, start to escalate, and that's working very well. Um, we're grateful to our colleagues in the asset management team because they've provided us additional resources to be able to deal um, with, with, you know, the, the cases as they're, as, as they're coming in. So in terms of... I think children's safeguarding, well, it's there in, in the report, and, and that can only continue. Um, so overall, the picture is very much um, that we're operating at a, a, a high level in terms of volume and complexity of work, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Vandenbroek first, then Councillor Pearce. Please, thank you. Thanks. Following up on the sort of chairs things, there are and what you've just been saying. On the recruitment, um, are you looking at innovative, flexible ways of employing people? Excellent, because the uh, research does show that that can give you far more benefit sometimes than, than increased salary packages. Very pleased to hear that. Um, and similarly, we, we, we've talked a little bit about some of the sort of legislative changes that have caused new pressure points on the service, such as the procurement, and then, you know, we were just saying about how Brexit had changed things. Just out of interest, what do you see coming up? Some of it might be here, but I might have missed it. What do you see coming up on the horizon as causing new, new pressure? I think it's... it's most of it is already here, so I, I think that it's very, very early days in terms of procurement. Um, the, we're in the process of amending our contract standing orders, and it remains to be seen um, how we adapt 
to, to the new contract standing orders and some of the quite onerous requirements in the, in the Procurement Act. Um, so I think that, that that will be a major um, area going forward for, for a, a while yet. Um, it's often the case with any new legislation, it's, it needs that bedding in time. Um, and as much as, as, as you can prepare, you, you, you simply have to go through it until it settles down and then you come out the other end and you've got systems in place. So I think the challenge is being proactive in, in developing systems to, to deal with things as, as they come along. Yeah, I just had to, just to return quickly to recruitment. Um, so j just something anecdotally I've, I've heard is that training contracts for young solicitors are extremely hard to get nowadays. And I'm just wondering, is, is, the, is the kind of the recruitment issues you're having at the more senior level, more experienced level, um, so you, that, that's not a, an option for you or is it something you're going to look at? It's very much at the qualified and senior level. Um, if we were to advertise a, a training contract today, I can guarantee you that we would get <laughs> lots of applications in. But to advertise for a, a, a senior planning lawyer, um, you're talking of applicants, or, you know, probably on one hand. Um, there are new routes for qualifying for um, solicitors um, now, and, and so that's reflected in one of our, of our apprentices. Um, so he's going through that particular route whereby um, he's studying and, um, and working at the same time. So that is consistent with our Grow, grow Your Own um, um, approach, and that's the model that we want to take go, um, going forward. Great. Okay. If there's no more on that item, I'd like to say thank you very much, Azuka, for that report. Comprehensive and detailed and well spoken to. So thank you Great. for that. Uh, in thank which you. case, we'll move on to item number six, which is street enforcement curbside strategy. Um, so we'll be receiving a update on parking traffic enforcement activity particularly with a focus on the financial elements, really, I think is, is where we're looking at it from this point of view of the panel. So I'll hand over to Brian Nibbs, Assistant Director of Transport, to present that. Thank you, Jim. Um, so this report is to um, note an update on activity related to the Council's powers in the status as uh, enforcement authority. Uh, the report provides an overview of parking and traffic enforcement activity um, and an insight into the budget position, which was originally requested by a committee at the Corporate Finance and Scrutiny Panel um, on the 30th of November 2022. Um, they initially considered the item on that day and looked at how the Council managed both revenue and capital budgets within transportation um, and subsequently requested clarification with a supplementary report with particular emphasis on Section 3 of the report, in particular points A to F. Um, in summary, it requests review of initial budget proposals set in 2020, a breakdown and review of our CCTV PCN is issuance. Um, for those of you who don't, don't know, that's the um, enforcement of moving traffic contravention um, in, in the borough. Um, this also coincides with our own review of the CCTV uh, moving traffic contravention um, review, um, which is also supported by our own financial management board. Um, C is a number of reports of illegal parking which results in PCNs. Um, a review of the CEO service, which is a civil enforcement officer, um, which effectively are the on-street enforcement of um, parking controls versus um, we've got a current hybrid model um, with, which is supplemented by agency staff. Um, e is how many PCNs are challenged and how we defend them. Um, and just a general summary of what officers feel um, around the budget expectation and our financial strategies. Obviously, there's a lot of history to all of this, um, and it's taken quite some time to unpick a lot of the background. I must note that a lot of the transport team that um, were effectively working on the original budget proposals no longer work for the council. However, I feel as though um, I have tried to present the report in a way um, that ultimately, although it's related to finance, shows that our overall aim is really to achieve compliance in, uh, in this borough along with all other councils and to also meet um, the demands and objectives of our transport and parking policies. 
Um, in the main, obviously, there's lots of work that goes on behind the scene, but ultimately, we are, um, we, we've come a long way in the last 18 months um, since we've been in, involved in the service. Um, we're currently implementing a reorganization to improve capacity um, and capability within the service, and we've tried to really stabilize the division. Um, and for me, there's you know, a lot of work that's going on and, and will continue to go on to assess and improve the CCTV and on-street enforcement system, review the model and find the most efficient way of achieving that compliance, reviewing all of our contracts, uh, reducing the revenue burden um, up, upon the service, and in order to meet our transport objectives, that will um, also include, um, you know, in order to clean up our, our, our streets, um, and to achieve compliance with our carbon neutral ob objectives, um, expanding our parking controls to manage those. Section four provides introduction into the background of the service and some information on parking. As I said, lots of work's been done in the last 18 months, not just across, you know, in the parking team, but across the transport division. There's still lots to do, but there's been some really big achievements in setting out our transport strategy and all of our associated policies. Um, agreeing the expansion of our electric vehicle charging estate, improving our cycle and active travel ambitions, but also our landscape. Uh, we have expanded parking zones to clean up our neighborhoods. We've fixed bridges um, and delivered a, a big highways term contract. We've tried to stabilize the division, and as I've mentioned, with the upcoming reorganization, we feel that we can really move forward with laying the foundations. Um, in Section 5 in the PCN issuance, you can see a steady increase in PCN uh, issuance over the last few years. Um, and I think I've tried to set out in Section 6 the budget proposals in seven revenue budget expectations, eight recovery rates, and then outline some of the service challenges. Um, there was quite a lot of um, things to answer there, but it was really important to try and tell a bit of the story there. So um, happy to continue, but happy to move over to questions also. I mean, I would firstly thank you for the detailed report. There's a lot of detail in there, a lot of data, which is really good for us to go over. I'm going to put my dunce's cap on or layman's cap on for people at home slightly, which is quite a natural fit as it turns out. But I wondered if firstly you could just praise or give a narrative to the, 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 how we arrived at we would generate this surplus. And I, I know it, there's different things I've read in the report. There's mention of an external company, I think, at one stage bought in that did a couple of days work I think I, that was in 6.8 I think unless I'm misunderstanding that helped arrive at that number um, yeah so second paragraph uh, and using a professional company brackets two days enabled an average estimated number of tickets to be calculated so I guess that was feeding into it so if you could just in kind of simple terms for those at home as it were just talk about how we said that because it's been a number of years, I think we forecasted that surplus as well over time, how we got to that forecast. So I think that, that relates to, um, so the, obviously there's expectation around the CBZ controlled parking zone growth. And in terms of CCTV AMPR, an assessment was undertaken of the locations that we expected to implement a CCTV camera to achieve compliance. Um, and a review effectively with another camera to assess the amount of contraventions that were taking place was the approach methodology to um, agree in those sites, that's my understanding. And that's what we would continue to do when finding and implementing new sites. Okay, so I take from that then the approach hasn't changed in how we predict it because we, and maybe Damon could comment on this. Firstly, how big a deal is it that we miss that surplus? Maybe I'm worrying too much that we never reach that surplus, right? Is that, is that a big deal? What impact does coming short on it have, perhaps? And that might help frame where we go from there. Yeah, so I think if we, if we look at um, what the projections were, so basically, obviously, the, at the time, um, yeah, the service has undertaken a number of surveys, done some calculations, uh, and come up with some sort of, you know, sort of forecasts and projections. Um, and then they find, you know, um, that's the groundwork, really, which then goes into the Cabinet and Council reports, um, which then flow into the medium-term financial strategy. 
So those particular forecasts obviously are embedded then in the medium-term financial strategy. They're not just the budget for 21-22, they're for 22-3, 3 uh, sort of onwards. Um, the fact that obviously performance um, uh, obviously didn't come and meet uh, those projections uh, meant that the council overall had a shortfall in its income and therefore a shortfall in its resources. And that's been reflected in uh, sort of monitoring reports um, over the last couple of years, um, which have basically said, well, you know, here's the budget for transport, which includes um, those projections for income, um, which haven't met over time. So therefore that shortfall was reported. Um, that's been going on obviously for a couple of years now. We're at the, the stage where whilst Initially, um, time was allowed for things to sort of bed in, correct, coming out of COVID, um, allowing, you know, um, uh, the, the service to get used to the cameras moving around and, and, and things like that. But we're at a stage at the moment, uh, basically, where, you know, income has not increased uh, appreciably over the last sort of couple of years. So in terms of the overall effect, um, where we find ourselves now coming into sort of 24, 25 is um, effectively the, the vast majority of that shortfall um, has now been realigned within the medium term financial strategy. So coming into 24, 25, um, so the vast majority of that has, uh, has, has, has been realigned. There is, um, you know, a sort of... Uh, um, you know, there is still work that is underway by the service at the moment in terms of, and I'm sure Ryan will allude to sort of some of this, uh, in terms of improving performance, um, um, so that all of that shortfall is effectively met. Okay, thanks. I, I suppose where I'm struggling a bit is this comes forward to the MTFS. It says we're going to achieve this. We don't achieve it, and that's happened a few times now. So what... Why isn't there a pushback or say, demonstrate to me, you mentioned that the service will look at, do some calculations, do all this, and this is what I was trying to we'll come back to, Ryan, maybe on what those calculations were. If, if we don't know, that's fine. I understand there's been churn in the department and whatnot, but I, I appreciate finance have a lot to do, but are these numbers not challenged when they're put on the table and said, how did you arrive at that number, particularly if it's been year on year not achieved? let you decide whether we go for the calculation or the challenge first on. Well, certainly for the, um, if we go right back to the beginning, um, and I think this is sort of borne out uh, in the report in terms of, this started as a line of inquiry. If we start at section six, 6.1, um, this is basically a line of inquiry where the, the finance team sort of turn around and say, well, we've done a bit of benchmarking um, uh, it looks like, um, you know, the amount of transport income that we receive as an authority appears to be relatively low compared to others. Um, question for the service then to sort of look into and go, well, okay, what's the, what, what's, what's the reasoning? The very, very simple reason there was um, the authority had only just received, I think, its license to uh, able to go out and enforce um, moving traffic contraventions. So there's your very simple answer as to why the benchmarking is where it is. Um, the service then um, is in the process of developing um, it, its plans in terms of a, a transport strategy. Um, and secondly, within that strategy, what does, you know, you know things like, um, you know, what are plans for CPZs and moving traffic contraventions? Service then sort of comes along and says, right, okay, we've crunched some numbers. Um, we think this is sort of feasible, goes into a challenge uh, sort of environment that says, okay, what's, what's sort of reasonable here? Um, and, I mean, for example, um, looking at uh, sort of one of the appendices um, that we've got in the report. So, for example, if you go to um, uh, sort of E1, uh, for example, um, you know, at that, at that point, oh, sorry, not E1, sorry, C1, I think. Sorry, it's Appendix C1. 
And on that page, I uh, appreciate you have to sort of rotate the screen. Um, if we go into column C4, sales, fees, and charges, uh, for example, pop down to sort of where Greenwich is. Greenwich is showing sort of 4.9 million of on-street parking. Um, there's a similar column for off-street parking just to the right of that as well. So if we look at that as the base position, that's the income that is coming into the service at that point. Is it reasonable for the service to actually uh, increase its income by the amounts that were actually sort of um, being proposed? Looking at the table, looking at the benchmarking, bearing in mind that's 1819, um, moving into the year 2122, you know, there's a couple of years uh, sort of difference in there. Um, on that basis, that, you know, there's an area of reasonability. The other uh, aspect to look at will be things like numbers of um, sort of tickets that can be issued, uh, numbers of, sorry, PCNs that can be issued as well. Um, now, it's quite varied. Um, ticket issuance across uh, London is quite varied, but not beyond the realms of uh, sort of possibility. So there's a, there's a sort of overarching reasonableness. Could this actually be physically achieved? It was deemed at the time by those um, uh, around that it was. That's really good, thank you. And, and that does make a lot of sense. So it's fair to say it was benchmarking against other London boroughs, what others had achieved that would support that we might be able to achieve those numbers as well. Yeah, and if I can just, just absolutely clarify now, and, and again, this is made quite clear in the report, this is not about revenue generation. Uh, this was, as I said, within the caveat of the department was in the throes of putting together a transport strategy and things like CPZs, MTCs were part of that strategy. Understood, thank you. Uh, Ryan, did you want to add anything to that? Um, no, not particularly. Um, obviously, the, I wasn't part of that budget process at the time and the surveys, etc. Thank you. No, completely understand. And, and it does sound like there was a rationale. There was a challenge, and that's why I wanted to check. And I, I guess that challenge still exists when it comes forward for future uh, MTFSs uh, when we get to there. Um, that's really helpful. Did any colleagues want to come in at this stage? On this side, too. Councillor Pierce. Yeah, so just um, I'm trying to keep up here a little bit, um, but um, I'm, I'm just thinking. So, do, does that mean then that the the sort of the budget for this is being revised, or is it, given that is, is that is that a can we expect a revised potentially lower figure for revenue, expected revenue, and things like that? Okay. Yeah, and, and I think, as I mentioned probably a couple of questions ago, uh, there's been a budget realignment exercise, so for 24-25, um, the vast majority um, of, of that uh, sort of gap has been realigned now. Um, and I think, as I was saying, you know, there's still a little bit of work for, for the department to do in terms of, you know, enhancing performance, um, and that's things like, you know, Making sure that you know cameras are you know in in appropriate you know sort of positions because clearly the idea here is actually to get um, sort of compliance you know the location is chosen because for, for you know for, for transport reasons clearly if the if the if, if the camera is not sort of generating uh, sort of tickets you know the predominant reason for that is because it's obtained compliance in that location however. There are numerous other locations within the borough that, you know, are, are, are going to need that, that, that sort of approach. Um, but, I mean, the overall answer to your question is, yes, there's been a very large realignment, and that, will fe that features in the 24-25 budget. Great. Thank you. Um, I have another one, if no one – Joe, did you want to – Councillor Vandenbroek? Yes, I've got a few, and I'm kind of like – grasp a bit so I'm really sorry if it does because there's so much in here it is a very very dense report and a lot of figures um, I a couple of things you know I just want to clarify I think it's quite clear isn't it that that there's the point that's made that any surplus as it were um, has to go into transport related um, work but I don't think there's any problem with that, is there? Because there's a huge amount of transport 
expenditure that needs to be done and the fact that most of it um, we're currently primarily used for any surplus to offset annual concessionary fares. I, that's great, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, there's t the number of times I sat on the Highways Commission, uh, Committee and we were talking people wanted additional traffic islands or crossings or whatever, and there's not enough money in the budget. So if there was more surplus, while still concentrating on the purpose of it, it's not to generate a surplus, but to keep the traffic running, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, there would be no problem in finding places to spend that money. Um, that, that's one point that I want to make. Um, yeah, actually, I've got three that are fairly separate, so I don't know whether you want to respond to that one first or... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I absolutely agree that there's a lot to do within uh, the transport landscape. Um, we are always reviewing our funding models um, and work closely with finance to um, look at how we can optimise our, our income and also to look at what we can do to um, also use our uh, developer contributions. We receive money from TfL. Um, uh, in terms of a decision for the concessionary fares, I'm not sure when that was made or, or you know, but ultimately it, it comes back into the council to make those decisions. Second point I can answer next. I, I didn't hear your second point, but um, I, I don't really know how to answer the question in terms of it's more of a financial um, decision, I guess, in terms of where that, where that money goes, which I wouldn't have um, authority to make. I suppose maybe it wasn't so much a question as a statement that there's plenty yeah. of space for expense. We're, we're spending a lot of money one way or another on transport. So yeah. if more of it was it's generated right from this, back it would, could yeah. only be yeah. for the good. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I also, I had questions about, um, there was, there was income per head per hour for enforcement staff. And this is kind of related to the next bit I'm going to come to. Um, it was less for the uh, fully employed staff and more for the agency staff. However, it was made clear that the establishment staff, um, the per hour, they also included their leave and sick time. And I just wanted to clarify that for agency staff, um, their hour... Presumably, they're paid that those hours are exactly for what they're worked. So, I mean, we ex I think what I'm saying is we would certainly expect establishment staff to have less if we're going to include their sick and their leave in that. I just wanted to make sure I had a, a proper understanding of that, that element. Yeah, so I think um, it, getting that data has been difficult to, to compare, but what I can say is that, uh, especially as part of our MTFS uh, budget proposals, um, we've put forward a full review uh, and options appraisal on the uh, civil enforcement. So we're, we're doing a lot of that reviewing at the moment to understand um, how to you know, most efficiently move forward with that service. Um, we're putting in a, 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 you know, a management tier as well as part of the reorganization to really look into all of that. Um, and intelligence and improvement of performance as well. So it's been difficult to get a lot of those data. It's quite a changing environment there. Um, there's been lots of stuff going on in, in the background as well in terms of the future of the service. Um, so we're really giving that some attention right now. Okay, and that leads into the thing that I was going to lead into, and that is the future of the service. Because some time ago we had a presentation in this room about the potential for outsourcing some of that service. Um, and there is in, um, in here, there's some potential savings mentioned for the service as a whole from outsourcing. And I suppose I'm slightly concerned to ensure that the financial um, outcome for outsourcing is, is, will be 
fully looked at. I mean, for instance, if we were looking at the saying that the agency staff get more PCNs per hour than the establishment staff, if that was a reason for the outsourcing, and I've just established that the that, that would happen anyway that way, be, because if we're... Councillor, sorry, I just wanted to check. Was that a public meeting? Ah, sorry, yeah. Ah, thank you. Yeah, it so wasn't. if we could just ignore that question. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. But I can talk generally about the proposals for outsourcing, ensuring that, that if those proposals for outsourcing more of the thing was based on some of this information. Um, it, I think it would be good for us to see further information about why the outsourcing would be proposed to make savings. Okay, that's my short version of it, and that's in this paper. I, I think if it's a resistance, if outsourcing may be an option that's being looked at, I guess, being as we ha currently have some agency CEOs uh, on the books. So what, what you know, is, is that an option that's being considered, I suppose, would be the first question. Is that fair to outsource? Yeah, 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 okay. And but what are, sorry, Councillor Vandenbroek, what, and the question was, in summary? The question was, I'd really like to know why the, where the potential savings from outsourcing sit and how they're, how they're looked at here and whether they are counted into future years. That's my short version. Okay. Um, so as Damon alluded to, and I did as well earlier on, um, there's a series of packages of work that we're delivering in terms of optimizing um, the surplus that we generate from parking. Um, Reviewing the, C the CEO service will um, require a report to be forward in terms of recommendations um, that not just looks at the financial element of it, but also the investment that's required and some of the technology that's needed to move the service on. Um, and the main, you know, what's shown there in terms of the, the MTFS budget proposal was an increase in PCNs issued across the borough. And I think one of the things that we need to consider as well in terms of our current um, parking control coverage in a borough as well, we've really accelerated that um, and we'll continue to deliver um, those types of schemes as we move forward, which has been set out in the MTFS, but also in our transport strategy. Um, and it's a very changing environment and we need to be able to be flexible and ultimately make a decision that really stabilizes a service because having that hybrid model at the moment um, I would say is, is definitely not sort of a morale booster for staff and ultimately we need to get to a resolution in terms of the way forward for the service. So I expect, you know, as following that MTFS proposal uh, in the coming couple of months that we'll have um, a decision on the, on the way forward for the service. Good stuff. Um, did you have one more? Do you want me to come back to that later? Are you good? Okay, thank you. Um, just one more I had, Ryan, on 3.3e, around what, how many PCN FPNs are challenged, how many do we defend, and how many do the wind lose? I, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room or not, but we should probably talk about the news coverage last year that revealed that we didn't send anyone to challenge tribunal hearings. So I wondered what the background was to that, why we made that decision not to send people to do that. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the ETA, um, at the tribunal. So at the time it was really just resource and obviously in hindsight it was a management decision at the time that um, you know, down to resource in terms of splitting you know, the back office works, you know, there's PCNs that are processed, there's permits that are issued um, and then we obviously have the, the team that deal with the appeals and representations and it is a small team and ultimately there's always a trend that sort of 50% of the cases that go there um, always you know, favour the appeal was such um, so it was just really down to resource um, but I can confirm that 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 is you know that it's reinstated and, and has been resolved in terms of us providing that evidence and actually really using it as a positive to um, make sure that we improve from the findings of that in particular around CCTV and PCN issuance and you know sometimes it can be as simple as um, 
traffic management order or, or, or a yellow line piece of road marking that, that might not necessarily be compliant. So we're using that as a tool to improve the service as well. Um, did I answer your question? Sorry. You did, uh, and I think, I guess it was a calculated decision made, but obviously once the news was out there, people would always send everything to tribunal knowing that RBG wouldn't appeal it, right? So it was a balance to be made there, I guess. But it's reassuring to hear that we do now staff those tribunals, so th that sounds good. Thank you. That's good to say. Uh, any other questions on this item from members of the panel? No? Okay, Ryan, I'd like to again thank you for pulling this together in the end. I know it's been, you know, we've waited a while for it, and I know that's not through lack of effort on your part at all. So thank you very much for producing it. We, we do appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. So, okay, with that then, um, we can bring the meeting to a close. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Fucking...